I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability, as well as its robust interior, are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is I Will Make You a Millionaire, another episode helping someone reach their goal of making millions. Imagine starting a business where your idea is, I'm going to be a bridesmaid for hire. It turns out... A lot of brides don't really have that many friends or it might not be that. Maybe they just are afraid to ask people or afraid to show favorites. I don't know. But Jen Glantz is part of the Millionaire Mentee Program where I'm advising a bunch of people basically how to make a million dollars within the next six to 12 months. She's been doing this Bridesmaid for Hire for six years. She wrote a book about it. She's pitched TV shows about it. But now we're looking at uh, how to really turn her knowledge into a million dollars and not just, you know, something that's not scalable. You can't scale yourself. So how can she do it? Enjoy this one where we kind of go over a business. And I find some interesting things out about weddings and relationships that I did not know. And they very much disturbed me. So perhaps that will lead to the ideas that will be worth a million dollars. been going on? You know, I'd say that it's been an, an interesting situation that I'm in. I'm running two businesses and I always like to be honest and say neither are as successful as people think they are. And a lot of that is my fault. So I think the pandemic was the perfect opportunity for me to get a kick in the butt to say everything that you're doing is broken and it's time to figure out how to not make it broken anymore. And that's well, why I reached out to you. Yeah. So let's, so I'm just curious, like I haven't seen you in a few years. Last time I saw on Facebook, you were getting married. I'm just, are you, are you married? I am. We ended up getting married on a sidewalk outside the coffee shop we met five years ago. And wow. we just, we did it spontaneously. We planned it in a couple of days. We threw out the idea of having a wedding and we just did that. And that was March 19th. March 19th of 2020? Of 2021. We did it this year. Yeah, we oh, canceled. Oh, wow. Okay, you just did it. You did like the one-year anniversary of the economic <laughs> lockdowns. <laughs> we did. Well, it's funny because we canceled the $30,000 wedding that we were supposed to have in October of 2020. We canceled that. We gave up on wedding planning. And then we just stood outside a coffee shop and got married. You've had a business of being a professional bridesmaid. And, we'll, and you could describe that in a little bit. But did that help you in kind of understanding your wedding experience? 
No, it made it worse because I was somebody who had been to hundreds of weddings. My opinion of weddings before I started the business was negative. And then once I started planning my own business, I, everything I thought I didn't want, suddenly I felt the pressure to need. So the pandemic for my wedding was a blessing in disguise because it allowed me to cancel this wedding I had planned that I didn't actually want anyway. Because you saw all the pressure and heartache, like the, the wedding is sometimes just like almost emotionally not worth it. Better to just kind of start on the marriage and use that money accordingly. People lie to you and make you think that the wedding is the best day of your life. But in my experience, going to all these weddings, it's not the best day of your life. It's one of the most stressful days of your life. And I witnessed that firsthand, but yet, you know, the wedding industry and everything you see and hear makes you feel like you have to do what everyone else is doing. And I fell into that trap and the pandemic canceled that wedding. And I felt, I felt like it was a good thing that happened for me. So are you two months in, are you happily married? Well, here's the other thing. I feel like getting married is so, you know, it doesn't change anything. That's also a lie is that once you get married, you know, everything changes for us. We signed the paperwork and we moved on with our lives and nothing has changed. And maybe that sounds depressing, but it's also the truth. It is just a moment in your life. Honestly, what I would like to celebrate is if we make it to 10 years, which I know we will, or, you know, celebrate the times in our relationship that were really tough that we powered through. But the celebration of us signing a legal document is so anticlimactic. And I knew that. I knew that going into it. So how has that changed your view of the business of being a professional bridesmaid? I always say that when I started this business, I started it because I hated weddings and I still hate weddings, but I started it because I wanted to be there for people. In the wedding industry, you have everybody who you hire who tells you what to do, but there's nobody that you hire that just asks you, what do you want and how can I help you do that? So I feel like even though I am in the wedding industry, I'm also not because I'm only there to help people. And that's different than any other person in the wedding industry. Maybe, um, I mean, it's such a unique business. I don't know if other people even do it, but describe your business for a second. <laughs> so I started Bridesmaid for Hire six years ago, and I started it in a very odd way. I had been a bridesmaid for my own friends hundreds of times, not for my own friends, dozens of times. It felt like hundreds of times. And there was one night after a couple of years where two friends asked me to be a bridesmaid in the same night. These were people I hadn't spoken to in a very long time. And after they asked me to be a bridesmaid, I was so depressed about it because being a bridesmaid is so expensive. It's over a thousand dollars each time you're a bridesmaid. And here were two people who I hardly knew asking me to be their bridesmaid. Is it rude to say, Hey, it's, it's too expensive. Expensive, I really can't do it. It isn't rude, but at a certain time in your life, that's hard to say because you're yeah. in your early 20s. And in my position, I didn't have the confidence. So I just agreed. And I came home to my roommate at the time and I bent it to her. And I said, Carrie, why is everyone asking me to be a bridesmaid? And she said, Jen, it's because you become a professional. And after she said that, I had this idea in my head of, hey, if I can do this for people who are hardly my friends, why couldn't I do this for strangers? What, what, what did your friend mean that you're, that you're a professional? She just thought I was good at it. I showed up on time. I didn't drink a lot of alcohol. I knew how to get the party started. I could deal with crying brides. She just, she just heard my, my stories of all these right. weddings and thought, Jen, they ask you because you're reliable. You're good. You deal with drama well. So after she said that to me, I thought, you know what? could I start a business? I don't know how to start a business. I was a poetry major in college, but I did know that if I put the idea out there, maybe something would happen. So I went on Craigslist and I wrote this ridiculous ad that offered my services to strangers as a hired bridesmaid for the day, posted the ad anonymously, and the ad went viral. I got hundreds of emails over one weekend of people all over the world wanting to hire me. And overnight- Really? Like what, why did they- like? Presumably, a lot of people have enough friends that they would have a bunch of bridesmaids. Yeah. So, so what what was the reason why somebody would want to hire you to be a bridesmaid? Let's say they hadn't been married before. They will, probably don't understand all the difficulties involved in the process of getting married. Why did they feel all of a sudden they needed a professional bridesmaid? 
Back then, when I read through the emails, there was two main reasons I saw again and again and again. Reason number one was because they had friends, but their friends were a complete mess. Their friends were sabotaging the wedding. Their friends were arguing. Their friends were quitting. Their friends weren't stable enough to do the job of being a bridesmaid. Reason number two, which is really why I started the business, is because a lot of people reached out and they didn't have friends, which is more common than we think. And they didn't have friends and they wanted someone to be there by their, by their side to support them, to show up for them. And they didn't have anyone that they could ask. So those were the two main reasons. I mean, so when they didn't have enough friends, did they say to you, oh, I don't have enough friends. Can you be my friend? You know, a lot of times they said, look, I've grown apart from my friends or two of my friends are pregnant. They're busy. The other two live across the country. Or they basically just said, and here's something that no one really talks about is like, hey, Jen, I'm getting married for a reason other than love. I don't want to bring my friends into this wedding. And that became something that a lot of people reached out to me. They were like, hey, I'm getting married for this reason. Can you be there for me? What's a typical reason? What are, what are two reasons why so many would openly admit? And first off, why would they get married without love? And why would they openly admit it? One reason why people would get married other than love is because they want to start a family. So they feel like just signing that legal document, starting a family with this person is the right way to go. But does the guy know that this woman doesn't love him? Often, no. Oftentimes, no. And and the thing is, they feel more comfortable opening up to a stranger like me and saying that to their, than their own friends. I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to question them. So they tell me that. I don't think I they mean, tell anyone do else. Do they like the guy or do they just like don't like the guy? I'll never forget one bride saying, look, this was the best person I could find at this point in my life. That's why I'm doing it. There wasn't love. It was more settling down. And that's what she did was settle. And I see that. I see that not a lot, but I do see that. Wow, I feel a little depressed on that. Like, I think I've avoided that most of all, but uh, who knows? You never know, because it sounds like people don't really know what their spouses think sometimes. I think, you know, we have this notion that people get married for this like fairy tale kind of love, but they don't always. And I see that people get married for just so many reasons. It influenced how I dated. It influenced how I found the person I got married to because I saw all of these different stories and reasonings and I knew what I didn't want. I also deal with a lot of people who aren't sure that they want to get married. They hire me to end the engagement or to help them figure out if they should go through with the wedding. I get that a lot. Really? And, so, yeah. so sometimes they, they want you to be a bridesmaid. Sometimes they hire you not to be a bridesmaid. <laughs> Like they hire you as a bridesmaid so that they could officially talk to you about the wedding, I guess. But then they really want more like therapy. How do I break off this engagement? Cold feet is something that is my specialty. It should be an added, I should charge more for it, but I can't tell you the amount of times I've I've worked with somebody or even shown up at the wedding and they have asked me, Jen, I don't want to do this. How do I get out of it? So that's something I've had to deal with quite a lot. I, and I think like, who else are you going to hire to do this for you? A wedding planner, they're incentivized to get you down that aisle. Your best friend doesn't want to see this wedding end. They're going to get you down that aisle. So who in the world is there to help you with that? And that's where I come in. What's another reason why somebody gets married without love? You know, I had one person get married. I'll never forget the story because she had a son and she wanted someone to help take care of the son. Wow. And, and so what does that mean? Like, are they going to, not once they get married, they're not going to have the couple's not going to have sex because there's no love or what's, I think it means let's sign the legal document and go from there. You know, people other than love are also looking for family, looking for finances, looking for other types of things. And they think legally binding themselves to someone else gets them closer to that. Maybe it's going to end in divorce, but a lot of the weddings I thought would end in divorce, they're still going strong. So you never really know. So, so I'm about to ask about that, but like, do you, like you're in New York City, do you see a lot of people marrying for money? Because I think that's a common thing in, in New York City. I think a lot of people will marry for a concept of love, like a baseline level of love, however you want to judge that, plus something else. You know, in my business, I'll say, so what made you feel like this person was the one? And they'll usually start with, well, we have a connection. So that's love. And then they'll add in something else. Like, well, they have a really good job. Or if I marry them, I won't have to work. So there's always an and or a plus to the reason why they're doing this. So what, um, you know, do you you then keep in touch with them and presumably find out later if they stayed married or got divorced? Do you keep in touch with them? 
I do. A lot of the times I don't keep in touch with all of them, but there are some I do keep in touch with. I'm still friends with the first person I, whoever hired me. I'm very grateful for her. And I'm friends with some people on you know social media and here and there. And it's usually like, you know, I always say the ones I thought wouldn't work out are still married. And some of the ones that I was so certain would work out forever ended in divorce. You never know. I really don't think anyone can predict it. Like what, what are some of the reasons people get divorced? Particularly like you've been in business a few years, they're, they're getting divorced pretty quickly. You know, a lot of the times people get married to a person they don't actually know. They've known for a little bit of time, which is fine because that could work too. But sometimes they don't actually know that person. They've never actually said, hey, let's look at our finances together. They've never said, what do you actually want in the future? Do we share common things that we want? So a lot of the tough conversations that I think sort of need to happen before you get married sometimes don't. And then when it comes to that moment, that's when divorce happens. Or a couple has had a great couple of years together without any type of adversity or problems or hardships. And then something like that happens and the foundation of the marriage crumbles. So I'd say those are the main reasons why I see some divorce happen. Wow. And, and, uh, it's so, it's so interesting. Uh, do you see, do you think do you have any predictive ability at all? Like, oh, these people get married, but there's some tension already. So it's the seeds of disaster are already there. I don't because I don't think you can judge a relationship from the outside. Sometimes tension or drama is what makes those two people flourish together. So even though I say I could never be with a person who talked to me like that, it doesn't mean that that person in that relationship, that might be right for them. So over the years where I thought I was an expert at being able to predict this, the truth is you don't know as an outsider, every relationship is so different. And the reasons why some work versus others has to do with those two people in it. Wow, it's so interesting. And then, uh, you know, I'm just curious. Like, do you see a lot of marriages end? Like, if you got, if the seeds of disaster are there, do you, do you, do you see anybody having affairs, or is someone already is anybody in the couple already seeing someone else if they're not marrying for love? Like, but they have some action on the side. Yes. Unfortunately, I do see that. Sometimes I see that on the bride side who hired me. Sometimes I see that on the person they're marrying side. I went to a wedding once where the bride in the bathroom after she said, I do was texting her boyfriend on the side. So yeah, I do see that as well. Uh, that's the kind of thing where it, ha it happens, right? You know, it happens. And I, I do see that. Yes. Why, why did that person get married when she clearly like had feelings for someone else? It's one of those very complicated stories that many people judge. And I, she I promise I won't judge. Like I'm very <laughs> non-judgmental. She had a son and the person she was marrying was gay. She knew he was gay and she married him because her goal was to A, get him to take care of the son, but also her underlying goal was to help him feel more comfortable in his skin eventually and come out as gay. He came from a very conservative family in Michigan who would um, probably disown him if he came out as gay. And she felt like she was doing him a service by marrying him and in exchange, getting the finances and support for her son. And why was he marrying her? because I don't think he wanted his family to question if he was gay or not. So this was his way of hiding it. And do you think they were happy overall? I not happy in the marriage, but just happy people. Yes and no. In some ways, yes, of course, but in no, in the sense that when you're hiding something so big, so large, how happy can you really be? So on the surface day to day, sure. But I'm sure that there was also a lot of really messy feelings as well there. Wow. That's so intense. And so, and, and you know, what's so interesting is by sending that Craigslist email, you were able to see that there was demand for your services without too much effort, really. Nope. Like if you have customers, you have a business and without much effort, you were able to know, see that there was a market for your services. Like, like what would you charge to be a bridesmaid? Obviously all the costs, but what else? You know, when I posted the ad, I had no idea. I had never started a business before. I didn't even think people would want this service. So I had no idea. I made up a price and I made up that price by looking at other vendors in the wedding industry. And then after year by year, when I go work these weddings, I kept charging more and more, but it's never enough. So my baseline is around 2000 and that covers six hours at the actual wedding and two phone calls before the wedding. Though a lot of people want add-ons. They want more phone calls before the wedding. They want in-person meets. They want me to come to the back bachelorette party, the engagement party. So all of those are extra. But Do they want you to organize the bachelorette party? Sometimes. And sometimes they just want me to be a guest. 
And what's the maximum you've ever charged for to do a wedding? The maximum I've ever charged for one wedding was around fifty five hundred dollars. I feel. Do you ever did you ever feel like you were undercharging because the, a lot of things in the wedding are very expensive? Like flowers alone could be like two hundred thousand dollars. All the time, and I think my problem is this is a service that when I started it, there was no one else doing it, so it was really hard to know the worth. Plus. People don't necessarily know they need this service until the service is in front of their face selling them. So it's very hard to, I always found it was very hard to put a very high number on it because they don't really understand the value until especially after they've had the service. Did, did you ever experiment like with just any of the random people who replied and said, okay, it's $20,000? I would love to do that. That would be fun. But like, like, like just to experiment, you know, I was once talking to, um, someone who recognized me and it was at the, um, that bookstore on spring street, right near Crosby. What's that bookstore? Is it McNally? Uh, yeah. Yeah. McNally's. Yeah. Yeah. Great bookstore. Is, it, is that still open? I hope it survived the pandemic. They have a couple of locations. They have one in Brooklyn now too. They have one in South street seaport. They're still all over the place. Yeah. I, I love that store. So anyway, I was sitting there and someone comes up to me. And she's like an older woman in her 60s, maybe. And she was telling me, you know, after she listened to my stuff, um, she was visiting her daughter in either Saudi Arabia or Dubai. I forget. Her daughter worked there. And she was, she seemed good at going up to people and having random conversations. That's why she was talking to me. And she said she started talking to someone who was like in some, one of the many royal families that exist. And this person asked her what she did and she said she was a life coach and she described how she do things. And he said, I need a life coach. What, what do you charge? And she said, let me think about it a day. And she told her daughter, she was going to charge maybe like, you know, 20 or 30,000 a year, something like that. And her daughter said, no, 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 charge a million a year. And she's like, I can't ask anyone for a million a year to be their coach. And in this, her daughter said, I'm telling you just say a million and just see what he says. And so she said a million a year and the guy said, okay. And she ended up through word of mouth from this guy, she ended up having three clients. And so now she makes 3 million a year from these three coaching clients. Wow. And so it never hurts. Like when you have like an overwhelming amount of demand to just see experiment with different price points. My fear that always holds me back is I want, I need, I want the money and I don't want the no. So that's a huge yeah. flaw of mine is charging that like basic price that I know I'm going to get the yes. And it's, it's completely flawed, but it's so hard when you're chasing the money, when you, when you have to make a well, certain amount. It's also very hard to be both the salesperson and the, the doer. Yeah. Yep. So, so like when you do the service that you sold, you want to do a good job, but you always realize, oh my gosh, this is so much work. Clearly I didn't charge enough. I'm, I'm making like the equivalent of $10 an hour for all the work I'm putting into this and, or whatever. And, you know, I was always the salesperson for any business I started. And I had that problem as well. I would undercharge, particularly like when I was in my first business, I would always undercharge all my employees and partners at the time would be so upset at me that I undercharged. But, you know, what can you do? It is hard to, A, it's hard to be the salesperson and the yeah. e executor, executor of the, the, you know, the one doing the thing. And then the other problem you have obviously is that you can't scale yourself. Like, would you put other people in as bridesmaids ever? Well, here is the big issue. Over the past six years, I've had a hundred thousand people apply to work for my company. Oh my and gosh. I can't hire all of them. The art of hiring is, is tough for this kind of job. But I've always seen that as a potential audience and I have failed at monetizing that. The best way I have monetized this audience was by creating a course called How to Become a Professional Bridesmaid. And that is the one way I've monetized that audience, but it's not enough. I don't want to franchise. I don't want to do that. And you know, yeah. I've had I've had people work for that. me. Yeah, I've had people work weddings for me here and there, but A, it's a high turnover rate. People burn out quick in this job. And two, the training, it's just, it's so much time for me to have to do that and then guarantee that they're gonna provide that excellent service that I provide. So figuring out what to do with that audience has been something I have completely messed up on. And I feel like if I could figure that out. I would be so rich, but I can't figure it out. And so you thought about the online course. What, what happened there? It's 
been, you know, mediocrely successful in the sense that some people latch onto it. But I think the main problem is I get anywhere between 25 and 50 messages a day on social media, in my inbox, on my website from people who say, I want to work for you. They don't want to take a course. They want to work for me. So I can't figure well, out. What, what about, what about though, if it's a course combined with like three or four post course phone calls or, or you're all in a Facebook group and you know, for the, the people who take the course and so they can communicate with each other or, or they can ask questions of you. You could have a Q and a once a week for everybody who's taken the course, you know, some kind of added, added value on top of the course. I, I was thinking that because I think, I think that the course needs to be blown up. I sell it for nothing. I sell it for $150. When I'm giving you all of my secrets, I'm giving you a business plan, I'm giving you everything I know, I need to probably charge more, probably give more one-on-one -on -one or even group access to me. But I do think that that is something that is completely underutilized for this audience. Yeah. So, so how many courses have you sold? I probably have, I've had the course since 2017. I have probably sold maybe 250, let's say. Not very much. When I have over, a, you know, every single year, God, I probably have like 25 K even more a year of people who are applying to work for me. And so that's amazing. So how, how did you market the course? So when you apply to work for me, it takes you through a whole funnel where you're introduced to the course and then it follows up with you. So there's a whole email funnel. It takes you to the course page. Um, it, it just, so it's like the application to apply for me is really taking you straight to the course. So I feel like, let's say for every thousand people who reach out to you, and apply, I would figure you would at least have, well, this might make sense then. Well, I would figure you would at least have like a 3% roughly, give or take conversion rate to the course. So that would be like 30 people a year. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah, that would be, well, that'd be 30 people per thousand. So how many yeah. thousand, you, you said a hundred thousand. So that'd be like 3000 courses you should have sold by now. Cause you've had a hundred thousand people write to you. Yeah. Um, why do you think your conversion rate is not as high as that? Because I think a lot of people just want the job. They don't want to start their own thing. Yeah. And I guess if someone wants a job, they might not have the money <laughs> to buy right. a course. Right. So, um, but at the same time, I would think, look, there's a lot of problems in, there's a lot of things brides have to watch out for. They need kind of almost professional help. That's not a wedding planner who is really charging an enormous amount of money to do this. There's a lot of help they need outside of just what a, a professional wedding planner. They need, there's all the, you know, what kind of wedding planner should you hire? What kind of wedding are you going for? Psychologically, what is your, what does the groom want? What do all the parents want? What, you know, why do you want what you want? Uh, you know, what the wedding planner is trying to up the cost for everything because they probably take some off the top. Like, how can you save on costs? You know, what other events you can have to make your wedding special? that the wedding planner might not be thinking of because it's not in her Rolodex. So it seems like having a course on how to be a professional bridesmaid would be very valuable to people because you would, they would learn all these things that you've learned from doing like hundreds or even thousands of weddings. I think there's definitely a problem with the landing page. I think there's a problem with how I'm selling it because it is, you know, at the price point that it's at, it is pretty obvious because there's not that much risk involved in $150 for a course. I no, think, it's, uh, it's less than 50 cents a day. Yeah. I think I am the one who's not selling it right. I think that's, I think that I could probably improve on the sales process. I'm guessing because it's not converting. So, so, um, does everybody stay on your email list who writes to you? Like, do you, do you make them sign up for your email list in order to apply for a job? Absolutely. And there's an email funnel for those who applied, but then every, so I have about 30,000 who are currently on my email list who haven't unsubscribed. And I email them once a month, standard once a month email. And it's mostly tips about, you know, weddings and things like that, fun tips. And then at the bottom, I always sell the course, but that doesn't convert very well. I think the click rate is 1% and the open rate on those emails every month is around 10%. Okay. So that's a really low open rate. Why do you think the, open, like not totally low, but like, I would think two things. I would think 20 to 30% would be a little higher just because it's, this is such a niche category and people want to do it. So let's just say 20% conservatively. Also, what's your rate of how, how, what percentage of the email list has not opened in six months? 
I usually do scrub the list three times a year. So I think, um, I don't, I don't know the amount that haven't opened it, but I do always scrub the list from people who have um, not opened it in, a, in the given time. So even with scrubbing the list, you have a 10% open rate. Uh, uh, so that's, that's interesting. I, I think, think I know the problem is because it's a mix of random people. I don't know why you're here. Are you here for wedding tips? Are you here because you want to work for me? I'm sending this general email with no purpose. So why would they open it? I no, almost I, need segments, right? Right. Like, well, it could be a combination of things you could do. I'm just hype. We're just, we're just, we're just riffing right now. You could, you could, uh, uh, obviously, send out more emails. I think sending out e more emails is important, but like you said, you have to figure out what they want. Maybe more about what sort of jobs are in the wedding industry or what sort of entrepreneurship opportunities are in the wedding industry. You know, yeah. how do you do a wedding in a pandemic? Uh, you know, all these sorts of things. I think, I, I do think you need at least once a week, send out an email, maybe even more. Or And you should also do some kind of Q&A type of thing so people can write back and ask you questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but yeah, your open rate would go up if you sent out at least one email a week, but, and then the click through rate to a website or course you're saying is around 1%. And like I said, maybe it should be more like 3% or even a little bit more. Okay. Let's put that to the side for a second. You mentioned you have two businesses. Is the second business the course? The second business is completely separate. It's me as a brand and me as a brand has around seven different income sources. None of them are wildly successful and some of them don't even give me income, but I do spend more time on me as a brand than I do the bridesmaid business. So me as a brand has a couple of different things. It has a podcast. It has a Monday email I sent out every Monday for seven years. Both of those things are not monetized. I have courses that I personally sell, coaching that I sell, freelance writing, speaking. So me as a brand has all of these different things underneath it that are generating not as much income as they should or no what, what income are, at all. What other courses do you sell? I sell about 15 different courses. Some of them are on personal branding, social media, podcasting, public speaking, like just a bunch of different courses on around different skills that I've mastered over the years. What what platform do you use? I use Thinkific. Okay. How are those courses doing? I would think, you know, how to do podcasting, how to do this, how to do that would be valuable. Here's something I've never told anyone before. I think that I'm really good at getting buzz. I'm getting good at getting attention. I am not good at converting and getting sales. So I have all of these things going on, but they don't convert very well. You know, like nothing is as successful as it should be for all of the work and experience I've done in my career. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes travel clothes. I'm trying, I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid, colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts are untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. <laughs> Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmaine.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James, that's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com.
You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his you can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game-like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. (laughs) 
how much do you follow, let's say, the ideas behind copywriting when you send out an email about your course? I've wor- been working on it, but not as good. One of the te- new techniques I've done is found other people's emails who I like and almost not copy it, but use their exact structure. That doesn't, it hasn't worked, but that's one thing. <laughs> like, uh, there's, there's kind of two sources of information about good copywriting. And this is, we're, this is just introductory talk. I really want to work with you. We've known each other a long time. This is just kind of, you know, getting reacquainted. But, uh, uh, you know, there's Robert Cialdini's book, Influence, which is, you know, has quote unquote influenced a lot of copywriters. But there's also this concept a little easier, the the four U's of copywriting. So when you're selling something, you should present why this is urgent, useful, ultra specific, you know, and then there's an unquestionable proof, user friendly. So, you know, then there's all the stuff like Robert Cialdini says, like fitting in there is like social proof, which is testimonials, authority, which is someone who's an expert in the wedding industry also has a testimonial. There's, uh, you know, scarcity that, uh, you know, you're only selling so many of these, or I don't know, there's lots of ways to get scarcity. And then there's this concept of the long email. So the longer someone reads an email, their brain tells them, Oh, why did I spend so much time reading this email? I must like this. And so then they're like, they're more likely to convert actually the longer the email is, you know, as long as it's not like five hours, you know, you know, like a 20 minute email to read or a 20 page email to read is, uh, so uh, there's all these things that I don't really like doing myself in a copywritten email, but they, they work. I think even before the email, it's getting the numbers to to come to sign up for to learn more about the course. I've never done Facebook ads or ads in general for these courses. The only marketing I've done is on social media or through my existing Monday email list, which has about 5k. So I don't get a ton of people who even want to learn more about some of these courses. It's that's that's the problem that I need to also work on too. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we I just got to a, a good picture of what's the, the two different businesses and what, what else are you up to? Like, I, uh, I remember there was one period, I forget when I ran into you and you were like, you seemed like you were stressed a lot. <laughs> All the time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I'd say like, there's two other really areas that I wish I was more successful in. Number one is I'm a writer. I've been writing my whole life and and you wrote a good book on, uh, be, oh, you know, being a bridesmaid, a professional bridesmaid. I did, and I did. I forgot it what the name of the book is. What's the name of the it's book? It's always a bridesmaid for hire, yeah. and it was published by Simon and Schuster. And you know, that was an interesting process, and it didn't sell as much as I think they wanted it to sell. So my name in sort of the nonfiction publishing industry is tarnished, and uh, yeah, not necessarily tarnished, but I think that happens more or less to everyone. And it's almost like you get put in a penalty box for a little while and then you have an idea and you could come out again, but also self-publishing is good. So that kind of solves the problem for a lot of people. So you don't, you don't get the advance, but sometimes you make more money than because you have more control over marketing deals and pricing and so on. This book I'm writing now was rejected by everyone. So I'm writing it and sending it out chapter by chapter and you pay a certain price and you get the chapters every single month. So I'm self-publishing my third book and, you know, I'm, I'm excited by it for sure. And I think there's a lot of benefits to it, but making it successful is all on you and marketing. And that's something I need to get better at too, I think. So book publishing has been something, and you know, the feeling of being sort of in that penalty box has really ruined my confidence. It's really shaken me up because you know, that's a hard thing to hear from a publisher. It is, but I I've been through this as well. Like there was, you know, I was writing about finance stuff for a long time and I was, you know, the publisher never doesn't really care about your career. They just care about their bottom line. So like one, my very first book was really, it was about finances in 2004. So it's a long time ago, 17 years ago. And I was writing just about finance then. And they priced it at like $80. So for an $80 book, it was sort of a bestseller. Like it was really acknowledged as the best finance book of the year by, by Barron's and by the other, other organizations. Um, but of course it didn't sell that many copies because 80 bucks. 
And the publisher made a lot of money, but everyone later was like, oh, you're, you're not really selling a lot of copies. There's no asterisk for these things. And then the, my, my, the final finance book I wrote, they, it was a book about buying stocks and it came out a month after the 2008 finance, financial crisis. It was like, a, a, literally came out a month after Lehman Brothers collapsed. And I kept saying to the publisher, who was Penguin, don't, nobody's, nobody wants to buy stocks. The stock market is crashing. They are, they are all selling stocks. This is going to sell zero copies. And it was basically true. And, but then afterwards, I go to a publisher and they were like, oh, you sold only these. Are not but then, you know, I switched kind of things I wrote about and I built up an audience in a different way. And then suddenly I got back in favor with the publishers. So kind of it goes up and down. But the, mo the, the most money I've ever made on a book was when I self-published. Yeah. Yeah, I think going through the process, I can see the benefits of self-publishing and I'm excited to continue to do that. I just think I need to get better at the marketing part of it because, you know, and, and by the way, the publishers don't market it. I had to market my own book, even though Simon & Schuster was publishing it. So I get that PR is my strength. But I think when it comes to selling books, you know, that's something that I, I want to get better at. I want to have a good track record there for sure. And the other area that I, I am passionate about doing is everyone, when they hear the idea of Bridesmaid for Hire, they think it should be a TV show. So I've gone through the process of having an agent, of pitching every major network many different times. It has never worked out. And this is the kind of year where I think I'm going to create, I want to create my own show, whether it's you know, a YouTube show or whatever it is, but I want to do a, a show or a podcast for Bridesmaid for Hire, and something that I own because I'm sick of waiting and pitching all of these people just to hear no. And I haven't yeah. done that. Yeah, I look, I pitched so many TV shows and I've had great agents, like the best agents for the types of shows I was pitching. Everyone was convinced this idea is great. Somebody will do it. I've had every meeting set up. And it's just kind of random yeah. what happens. Like it's hard to it's hard to base a career off that. I was talking to one guy who actually wrote one of my all-time favorite TV shows, and he showed me a website he created with all of his failed pitches. And some of the ideas were so brilliant. I love them. And and this is a guy who wrote a great TV show already. And he and it was like this this cemetery of like bad pitches, not bad pitches, but pitches that didn't get accepted. It's just so, it's such a bad world, I think that, and it gets your hopes up and you get disappointed. Like I never like that as a plan because yeah. it's so uncertain and, and it's kind of a mentally ill kind of uncertain, like dealing with Hollywood or is like dealing with a bipolar person. Like they love you and then they hate you. They love you and then they hate you. And it's, you don't want to kind of establish career depending on a bipolar person. In this case, all of Hollywood. I can't agree with you more. And I think a huge flaw is I've spent too much time caring about that and not enough time caring about my business and making money. I created something that's a great idea. Yes. But I've worked too hard to try to make it into something that Hollywood cares about or book publishing cares about and have failed at making it something that's, you know, monetarily successful. And that's why I need to really get my acts together because you know, I was playing into ego for so long. And I think that that really hurt me. It hurt my business. It hurt me. It hurt my decisions. And yeah. Yeah. Cause you feel you go on all these meetings and you feel discouraged. And after you're rejected like 20 times, you feel a little depressed. So it's harder to get back to work. Yeah. So, so it's a whole process that could last like six months where you're not at optimal performance. Exactly. And I think it, you know, plays into the, I, I feel like I'm someone who thrives on external validation. So when you hear people liking it, they like it, they like it, they like it, then they don't, it shatters you. And I think that I've struggled with that. And, you know, I've been doing this business for six years. It's not as successful as it needs to be. A lot of people would have ended it years ago. I'm still holding on to it because I do think there is potential that I just haven't explored. Well, well, in both businesses, you, you have a problem with scaling yes. because it's you and you know, I, the, that's hard to figure out. The easier thing is you can you can charge more. So if you have, you know, it's the whole thing. If you have half the amount of customers, but you charge twice as much it's sort of better for you and yeah. you, you don't have to do as much work and, and you're making more money. You feel better about the work you're doing because you're making more money. You feel like you're, you're earning what you're, you're worth. You're, you're definitely, on some of these weddings, they're spending a lot of money, like I said, on flower arrangements. 
they could certainly afford to pay you more and you're providing an important service that, you know, they probably feel like they could do without you is the problem because it's like you said, nobody knows they need you until they are aware of you. Yep. And so, so it's sort of better to have a business where you're, you're actually so solving a problem they realize in advance rather than creating the market yourself. But that's another issue we could, we could think about, but how's, how's other things going? Are you, are you, uh, healthy? <laughs> I, I think so. I think I could be healthier. I think I spend too much time sitting in this spot and staring at a computer, not really doing anything. And I think, you know, even after reading Skip the Line, I was like, Jen, you actually really don't spend more than a couple hours doing work. You spend so much time sitting, doing nothing. So knowing that, knowing that can really just sort of just change my life. But, you know, I've been working for myself as a solopreneur for six plus years. And sometimes it's just, it's hard to be by yourself and make all of the decisions by yourself. And I think I I've fallen into a negative pattern where some days I have to work overtime just to be able to focus and do one hour of work because I'm just feeling so down and so unsure. Yeah. And, you know, I'm struggling with this idea of, I, I feel like, you know, I, I, I'm the kind of person who am so aware that life is not going to last forever. I'm this kind of person who lives with such urgency, which is a good thing, but it's my biggest flaw because I try to do too much at once you know, and, and I think that kills me it's because I am always doing 15 different things at once and none of them are successful. Yeah, no, I, I, and the thing is that's okay. If so, if, if you're doing 15 things and two are successful, that actually might be a pretty good success rate, but the two that are successful have to make a lot of money. Yeah. They yeah. can't just make a salary. They have to make more than that because you're putting so much effort into all the things that are not working out it's, it's, you're, you're putting too much work into just, and, and getting paid what you would get paid if you just had a job and life would be less stressful and, and so on. It's almost like it's a mindset thing where you have to think about it differently in terms of, you know, what you charge, how you market, how you scale, uh, how you, how you advertise, how you deal with your customers. Like, like for instance, once the wedding's done, what else, what else, is there anything else you can, is there any other service you offer people who have gotten married? I don't. And it's also hard because there's not a lot of referrals because when people hire me 75% of the time, they don't tell anyone they've hired me. It's a complete right. secret. So it's not like I can They're say, Hey, in some right, cases. I, I can't say, Hey, Jessica, can you refer me to your friends? Because Jessica doesn't want anyone to know. So do you get, do you get testimonials though? I do. Yes. I get testimonials and those are great, but you know, there's no, like the, the referral aspect of this business is challenging and thinking about what could be next for these people is something that I haven't really explored either. So, so uh, let me, let, let me go a, a different direction. And again, this is all just gathering information. I, I like to do that. And obviously you're working on all these things. Do you feel like, do you ever let yourself just be, uh, creative and not put too much pressure on the creativity? Like, you know, like, so I have this thing where I write down 10 ideas a day. Like what's your kind of creativity practice? Writing is everything to me. And even if it's writing a couple of sentences, I keep an Excel spreadsheet and every day I try to just add one line to the Excel spreadsheet of something I've written, whether it's a thought, an idea, a poem, whatever. So, you know, that's something that I try to keep up with, but I am the kind of person who would benefit from the 10 ideas a day because I am somebody who has a ton of ideas, but I don't do yeah. anything with them. Yeah. You have to write them down because I remember yesterday I was watching some YouTube videos and suddenly like a, a, a light bulb went off. I don't know where I got the title from, but this would be a great idea for an article and maybe even a podcast. And I thought, and I didn't write it down. I said, Oh, I'll remember it. But of course this morning I wake up and I'm starting my 10 ideas a day. And that would have been the first thing. And I totally forgot what I was thinking of. So that happens to me all the time, which is another reason why I do 10 ideas a day, just to remember the ideas I have at like random moments. And it's really important because, it, you know, most ideas are going to be bad, but later on you might come up with another idea and like, oh, didn't I explore an idea like that a month ago in my ideas? And you kind of mix and match and, and you think to yourself, oh, I had this great idea for a book, but maybe it could be 
a newsletter instead, or it could be a speech instead or, or whatever. So it's good to write those 10 ideas a day down, even if they're bad ideas, just to kind of like grease the wheels a little bit so that A, it'll improve your creativity when you really need the creativity and B, you know, you, you have ideas about your business one day, but then you expand on them the next day and you know what you're expanding on. So uh, just, just having them, and you don't even have to be so organized about it, but I think it's just good exercising that muscle. So that's, I think that's really important. Yeah. So let, let me ask this, like if you, if you had like infinite money, what would you do during the day other than, uh, other than watch TV? <laughs> I would write books and I would do something with video. I, I love to speak. I love the camera. I love to inspire people. I love to be honest with people about my experiences. So I think I would write books and I would have, have some sort what, of what show. What would the books be about? Nonfiction is my, my specialty. So nonfiction short stories is what I've always written, but I'd love to write some you know personal development books. I'd love to try to write fiction. And just, I would love to write more books and I'm my own worst enemy there. And it's not something that's so super profitable and I'm chasing money all of the time. No, so uh, bo books, even though there's been times when I've made, so, so in, in writing, I've made uh, money from books and I've made money from writing, uh, particularly in the OOs, I made money from writing articles. Now you can't really charge to write articles, but back then you could charge to write articles. Now though you can't, cause there's just, too many is too much going on. And, uh, I've made money from writing, selling newsletters that I would put a, extra effort in and I'd hire people. So I needed to, to charge for them. Uh, and that was the most successful way I've made money writing. And now I would say I'm a, a highly paid writer, but still you need other streams. Like, yep. you know, it's sort of like you need, like writing is always good for income, but it's still not, uh, it still depends on you and your personal brand. So it's scalable in the sense that a lot of people could buy a book, yep. uh, infinite number of people could buy a book, but they're buying your book. So it's not like, so then you have, you have to write it again. You have to write another book to, to make more money again. So it's even, no matter what you're writing, there's still, it's good for income potentially. If you, if you really do everything right after like 15 years of writing professionally, I kind of finally was, let's say making a great income from it but you still need other sources where you're building equity value instead of income value. So income's great because it's cash rolling in and it's a little bit more reliable, but equity value is when you create something that where the business itself, where your idea is infused with enough kind of validity that it, it, it exists on its own eventually without you. So it's either sellable or it gets, it grows much bigger or whatever. So it's sort of like you need both things happening at the same time. And it sounds like you tried to combine these things. You build a business, but the business depended on your name. And I've done that too, in many cases. And it's not as, it's not as fun. Yeah. Uh, cause it's so much work and, and then no, you know, if you die, then, then right. your business is worth nothing. Right. So nobody right. wants to buy that business or invest in it. Uh, it's so it's, it's not that kind of business. It's like you say, it's like a solopreneur or it's like a lifestyle business as opposed to a real business. Yeah. Uh, uh, but even your business, uh, the bridesmaid stuff is not a lifestyle business because you can't do it from the Himalayas. You have to always be going to these weddings. Right. And there's only 52 weekends in a year. There's only so many weddings you can go to. So you're even capped on how much you can make with that business. Exactly. So not only can't you scale, but, but you're, there's only so much you could sell. There really is scarcity, but in a bad way, like it's, it's not, you know, it, it's too scarce. Yep. Uh, and then what else? Like what others, what did you do before you were doing the bridesmaid, uh, uh, uh thing? I was working full time as a copywriter. I ended up getting laid off. It was the best thing in the world because I'm not meant to just do one thing for a company. I've always wanted to start my own business. You know, I, I want to be known. I've, I've struggled with this because I, of course, want to do something big with Bridesmaid for Hire, almost so that it's on autopilot generating that passive income. But I don't want to be known the rest of my life as the Bridesmaid for Hire. And that is what I am known for right now. I would want to start another business. I love the idea of doing something in e-commerce, creating products, like have some ideas for that, you know? So I feel like doing something else that's like, awesome. That's not just me and bridesmaid for hire. It's, it's, it's my legacy as of right now. It's what I'm known for. It's what I'm most recognized for, but I don't want it to be everything. I don't want it to be the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, 
okay, this is really good. Like I really, I'm going to, I'm going to think a little bit more about the bridesmaid stuff and what you've been doing around it. Uh, can you send me on the second business? Can you send me what, how I find your other courses yep. and stuff like that? Yep. And like all of them. Yep. And, and also any marketing materials you've used for those. Yep. I want to just take a look and, uh, uh, same. And also send me, you might as well send me for the, or put me on the email list for the, or send me some old emails that you've done with the bride stuff. doesn't matter when you wrote them yep. or, or when the last one was, you know, sometimes I know these things are erratic. <laughs> and so I want to take a look at them. And I also want to know, would you be willing to do something that is not one of these things that we've talked about? Yeah. Like, like, if sure. you, like if you felt an idea was good, do you get excited about business, for instance? Yes. Even if it's like, let's say you came up with a good business, but it's not something you've been passionate about, but are you passionate enough about business that you would do this idea? Absolutely. And I'm passionate about doing things that are brand new to me. So yes. Let me ask you a question. On social, how, how many wedding planners would you say there are in the country? Thousands. Um, by the way, I'm not suggesting you would be a wedding planner, yeah. but you would say, you would say there's thousands. And how do they market? Yeah. A lot of them will pay for ad placement on wedding websites like The Knot or Wedding Wire, places like that. They'll they'll have profiles there that they pay, get reviews. A lot of it's word of mouth. Um, you know, I haven't spent a dollar on marketing. All of my marketing is that I've done for free on social media. I also do freelance. I do a ton of freelance writing, so that's gotten my name out there. But a lot of them will pay to get their names out there. So, and it's interesting. Like just looking at the math. If you're at, let's say your highest is 5,500, but your lowest is 2,000. So let's just say your average is 3,000. Even if you, and I'm assuming, do they, does that include costs or that's on top of costs? That like does it, not include travel or accommodations or the dress. Okay. So they pay for all that. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, and do you mark those up or no? I don't because I, that's yeah, fine. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, right. that's fine. And uh, so, so on average, then you're making like a $3,000 profit even if you're booked 50 weekends out of the 52 uh, in a year, you're only making $150,000 tops. And I say only, that's obviously yep. a huge salary, but for someone who's taking the risk, that's a huge salary for someone, let's say, uh, you know, working a, a very decent job, you know, and, and rising up and they have a career at some company. Yep. But when you're an entrepreneur, you're taking risk and you have to get paid for the risk. So it's not good enough to make in a good year uh, a, a decent salary. You have to make no. more of that than that, considering that next year you might there might be a pandemic and there's no weddings. <laughs> right. And and so you didn't take into account that risk. Every everything ultimately is about assessing the risks. Yep. Because the rewards are there. If you have a good business, the rewards are there. So that so really you have to understand what are all the risks. And and one risk in the bridesmaid for hire business is that something like a pandemic happens and you don't make any money. So the last year, year's money has to stretch two years. Yeah. Or another risk is that uh, you, you underestimate your cost and, uh, and the time and the effort required. And so you don't really charge a lot. Uh, another risk might be that there might be just some dry periods where people don't want to hire you or that, or you need to market again and, and you haven't done it. And, and, you know, you, you lose customers a little bit. So another risk is that you don't have anything extra to sell. Most businesses, when they sell something, like when you sell an iPhone, uh, the Apple may, sells another iPhone the next year to the same person, yep. or they sell a Mac to the same person, or they sell headphones to the same person. You don't have anything else really to, to sell to even your, even customers that love you and would love to work with you again on anything. They loved you so much but they, you don't have anything else to sell them. Yep. So yeah. it's also a risk, like being the human who's the service, like, you know, one getting yes. sick or two, like you, it's, it's burns you out going to 52 weddings a year. You know, it's a lot for one person to do. So yeah, there's a lot of risk in being a human being the business. So I think, so first thing is I really liked you to do the 10 ideas a day. And normally I wouldn't tell people what to do the 10 ideas a day about because the point of writing down 10 ideas a day is not to have 10 good ideas because that's impossible, but just to kind of exercise the muscle. Like I, I don't, if I have, if let's say someone's weightlifting 
it, they don't have like, oh my gosh, I had a really good weightlifting session. Now I never have to weightlift again. <laughs> like that never happens. You just wait, you weightlift because it's exercise. Yep. So by the way, I don't weightlift at all. <laughs> but, um, but, but, you know, you're you, the same thing with the 10 ideas a day. Usually there's not like a point to any of the idealists. You just do them as exercise. But I think it would be great to do a list. You should do a list of what are all the risks in the bridesmaid for hire. What were the risks in the online course? What were the risks in the other business you have with, with the, you as a brand? So I think those three idealists you should do. And, uh, and then I, I just want to, I want to take a look at your stuff and then kind of shoot some, I'm going to pitch you ideas, okay. uh, next time to see what things kind of resonate and excite you and, and so on. But, um, but these are, these are all great stories. Let me, I, I'm, I'm obsessed with the marriages that don't work out by the way. Like this has nothing to do with anything, but like, so you you've only, you've been doing this for like four years, right? Since Six 2017. Years. I've Six been doing years. this since 2014. 2014. And, and that's relatively right. I mean, you're still, these marriages, all of the marriages that you've been a bridesmaid for hire at are still relatively young. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, but you're telling me some of them are having affairs even on day one. Yes. <laughs> and so oh, I've never heard this thing where some people are getting married and they'll willingly admit that they're not in love. Like what's, what, what's another, like, and I know you've written about some of these in your, in your book. I think we even talked about your book on yeah. one of my podcasts, but what's like some of those strangest stories? I, I want to be disturbed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I think the thing is, you know, you have to know this, that like people tell strangers things they would never tell anyone in their life. Yeah. And that's a big reason why they're willing to pay me the money is to sit down and listen to a lot of this stuff. They have no one else to tell. So, you know, I mean, a crazy moment where I'll never forget was I went to a wedding in Staten Island and five minutes before the wedding, the bride pulled me in a room, locked the door and said, Jen, I don't want to do this. And, and was that, it legit or was she just getting pre-wedding jitters? It was legit because the person she was marrying's ex-girlfriend or maybe whoever this person was had shown up. And she was disturbed by that person, by seeing that person there who wasn't invited. So in that moment, I had- And, and, and was, her, was her husband- her, or her fiance cool with the other woman showing up. And he's like, Hey, why are you worrying about this? Like what, why did that, why, why was she so close to not wanting to do it? That just that event, uh, made her not really not want to do it. Based on, you know, in cold feet in general, what I think happens is you get to the moment where you're about to jump off the diving board and you panic, you start to see everything you've been hiding. And I see that a lot. I see a lot of people who suppressed feelings, emotions, everything until the moment they're about to do it. And then they go, I can't do this. Sometimes it's panic and nerves. Other times it's validated because they've suppressed so much. And, you know, I've had a bride hysterically crying as the music is playing for her to walk down the aisle, clutching onto me because she does not want to do it. I've had people who told me years later, Jen, remember at my wedding, as I was walking down the aisle, I kept thinking to myself, this is going to suck to have to do again. They knew in that moment, it just wasn't right. So I think that that's actually something that people will admit who knew it wasn't right is they knew it in that moment, that moment when you're about to the doors open, everyone's watching you that moment. Some people in their head know for a fact, this is not the right idea, but they do it or they don't, but that's not something people really talk about, but it happens. So, so what happened in that case Did she did, so she calls you into a room, you're a stranger, but she's hired you to yep. listen to her five minutes before she's supposed to get married. What, what did you tell her and what did she do? You know, it's the tough part about this job, I think is the human dilemma. You know, I, I always say like, I'm never going to tell a person what to do, but I will help them figure out what decisions they have. So I basically said to her, if you don't want to do this, we don't have to, I'll call us an Uber. We'll get pizza. We'll get out of here. But before you do, I think for human decency, you need to speak to the guy you're about to marry. So I locked them in a room. I put a timer on for 10 minutes and I made them talk. And during that time, the groom's best man, all the friends are just yelling at me. They're mad that I didn't make this happen. And after the 10 minutes happened, the bride and the groom decided that they were going to go along with the ceremony and the wedding and not sign the marriage license just because they had 
you know, 200 guests sitting, waiting for the wedding to start. And it was the kind of wedding where everything went wrong. It was raining and it was an outdoor wedding. It was raining so hard, the tent collapsed. And when they went to move the cake for them to cut the cake, the cake fell on the floor. It was like one of those weddings where everything went wrong. And it was, it's tough. You know, she went through with it, but then a couple of weeks later, they broke up. They never really? actually signed a marriage license. Wow. And how, did you talk to her after that? Like, what was that like? You know, in that situation, she did reach out to still be my friend, but I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to be her friend. I, I just, you know, I think no one knows this about this job, but I am somebody who is very empathetic. I take on a lot of people's emotions. So I leave these weddings and I'm depressed. I crumble. I'm like hysterical because it's a lot for me. You know, these are situations that before this job, I'm not a wedding expert. I never liked weddings. I stumbled into this profession and I've seen and, and taken on so much emotion. So in that situation, I just couldn't bring myself to, to be her friend just because I, I just, I don't know. Sure. I couldn't, I couldn't. No, I, I know the feeling, I, you know, when you're also, when you have a service where you're open to the public, people think they know you. Yes better than they know you. And sometimes it's really hard because you can't communicate with everybody, even if you want to, yep. even if you like everybody, you still can't communicate with everybody. You know, one other idea list to think about is I'm really impressed that Craigslist, a uh, one Craigslist email was all like some people build millions of dollars worth of software and you just send out a Craigslist email to start your business and maybe just brainstorm. And again, this is where it's great to have bad ideas just focus on having bad ideas first. <laughs> okay. What are other businesses you think could be started with just a Craigslist email? Because I've seen a couple of cases where this has happened. Mm. And I'm just curious what, what you come up with. Like, what would be 10 business? And by the way, you have to do 10 on all of these. Okay. What, what would be, because seven, eight, nine, and 10 are the hardest ones yeah. to come up with. <laughs> it's easy to come up with the first four, five, or six. But for even for me every day, seven, eight, nine, 10 is always very, very hard. But uh yeah, what are what are 10 businesses that someone could come up with with just a Craigslist email or ad? Okay. So I think that's an interesting list. I'd love to see that list. Yeah, no, I'm excited to, to brainstorm that and get some bad ideas out there too. Yeah, bad ideas are key. Like, you know, here's a bad idea. Hey, I'm selling psychedelic drugs. If you if you live in the <laughs> Kansas City area, uh, give me a call. Here's my phone number. Yeah. And I'll sell you LSD whenever you want. So that's like a bad idea, but clearly that would probably be an email that would maybe work unless people thought you were a cop or whatever. So, yeah. um, no. but that's definitely a bad idea. Yeah. I, I get another bad idea. I get messages at least once a week, people, guys, of course, asking if they can hire me as a wedding date kind of thing, which is, you know, an obvious idea for a list like this, but a horrible business idea in general. Yeah. But that's interesting though. Let's, let's talk about that next week. Do you have time next week to meet? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Well, good. I'm glad we, we did a, a, a first session. This is good. Yes. I'm excited to work with you on this. And I think you're, there's a lot of ideas we could do. I've been thinking of ideas nonstop since we started talking. <laughs> so let's talk about them next week and uh, yeah, work on the idea list and send me all your stuff. And I'm well. excited for, for next week. Thank you, James. This means so much to me and I really appreciate your time. And I'm going to do all this work. In Tresto, Sucubitril Volsartan Tablets is the number one heart failure brand prescribed by cardiologists and has helped over 1 million people with heart failure. It's a prescription medicine that treats adults with long-lasting chronic heart failure and works better when the heart cannot pump a normal amount of blood to the body. Don't take Entresto if pregnant. It can cause harm or death to an unborn baby. Don't take Entresto with an ACE inhibitor or Alice Kieran. Or if you've had angioedema with an ACE or ARB. Don't take with Alice Kieran or within 36 hours of taking an ACE inhibitor. The most serious side effects are angioedema, low blood pressure, kidney problems, or high blood potassium. Angioedema is swelling of your face, lips, tongue, and throat that may cause death. If it causes difficulty breathing, get emergency help. Ask your doctor about Entresto. To learn more, visit support.entresto.com or call 833-446-6699. For pricing, visit entresto.com backslash cost. If you can't afford your medication, Novartis may be able to help.